to uh, introduce Jerome Lewis from the UK, a very distinguished economist, uh, anthropologist, I forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we've been talking uh, several times now, uh, Jerome, uh, on, uh, on working together. And so you, uh, as we'll soon find out, uh, work with uh, hunter-gatherer societies, not only, not only uh, as an anthropologist, but also as an advocate. And, uh, and one of your um, projects is called Flourishing Diversity, which I'm sure you'll be talking about. And we can flesh this out um, after your talk in the Q&A, after you give your formal talk. I asked uh, Jerome to give two talks in this series, one on uh, this one on egalitarianism, which, which is just a core concept for multi-level uh, selection. And then secondly, on the role of, of music in the organization of hunter-gatherer society so we can understand the nature of the arts and that you'll be giving two weeks hence for our noon time slot. Next week, we're gonna hear from uh, Timothy Waring who is a, um, a colleague of, of mine, a fellow cultural evolutionary um, uh, scientist at the University of Maine. And so he's gonna be talking about some contemporary work uh, centering around cooperatives, so cooperative organizations. And so that's, um, that's uh, next week. And also uh, every week there is a cafe every Friday in addition to a seminar and they, and they trade their time slots, it's, uh, noon uh, Eastern and 6 p.m. Eastern. So today, noon Eastern, we have our seminar and at 6 p.m. today, we have our cafe, which is a much more informal get together. And everyone is welcome to go to that. Uh, uh, Juliet, maybe you could put the link into that. Well, Jerome, let's go. Okay, well, thank you very much, David. Um, I'll share my screen so that you get some images to give you a little bit of an idea of the, um, well, the societies I'm going to be talking about today. Um, here we are. So I've been working with uh, hunter-gatherers, but particularly this group of Bayaka, who also call themselves the Bambenjedi, since around uh, 30 years, actually. And uh, I lived initially uh, for three years in the forest with my family. Uh, you can see my young son to the right there. And we very much are integrated into this community. In fact, we were I was only supposed to do a year and a half field work, but we were enjoying living in this place so much uh, that we we really were very reluctant to return home and it was actually the outbreak of civil war in the Congo that caused us to flee in 1997. But uh, the reason I mention that is that people often think that these are simple societies, that there's something easy and sort of laissez-faire about egalitarianism. But actually egalitarianism is a consistent effort by all the members of the society to maintain it. And it's actually a very sophisticated effort. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today just about a couple of those areas, the key areas in, in that effort. I'll, I'll, I'll outline, of course, the more general practices. But uh, in order for you to really get a grip or get, get a sense of what I mean by egalitarian societies, I'm going to particularly focus on, on sharing and taboo in this uh, talk. So sharing, of course, is something we're all familiar with, but there are some very distinctive elements about it in these hunter-gatherer societies. Um, whereas taboo is something perhaps that we're less familiar with, but it offers a very important mode for these radically egalitarian uh, societies to govern themselves without recourse to authority figures. And, uh, and, and, and as we'll see, uh, as we proceed, I hope uh, that will become, uh, or the reasons for that will become clearer. So these such societies are actually much more common than most people realize. They're still, of course, just a tiny fragment of today's uh, population. Uh, in general, in the countries that they do live in, they're much less than 1% of the national population. Um, but when you think of the total range of human diversity, these hunter-gatherers are actually uh, on the most diverse. They, they offer the greatest contrast to 
the sort of dominant societies that we're familiar with. And, and, and that contrast really is uh, particularly important in the context of the sort of endless juggernaut of this uh, modern society, the ideas of progress and uh, modernity that seem to govern so much of international initiatives, uh, schooling, approaches to state organization, to representation and so on. And uh, in that context, as we look for different ideas about how we might organize ourselves, I think that these egalitarian societies offer extraordinarily important uh, clues and suggestions about what is possible for the human condition. And if we're understanding human evolution, it's absolutely crucial to appreciate uh, the importance and context of uh, egalitarian social relations for escaping from the uh, fear the competition, the Machiavellian politicking of our closest relatives, the chimpanzees and the gorillas. So modern capitalist societies tend to be structured according to hierarchies of power, of specialization and authority. And we reward producers in such a way that it actually results in extreme forms of political, economic, social, gendered and racial inequality. Hunter-gatherers such as the groups I'm going to be talking about today uh, contrast themselves very explicitly from these hierarchically organized societies that surround them. And they, they talk about themselves in the case of the Bayaka who I work with, for instance, as forest people and talk about people like us as village people. Uh, in, and and this, this sort of uh, contrast is, is very common among such groups. Uh, the Batek who live in Malaysia, for instance, you can see down on the left hand side of the image, uh, they talk about themselves as Batek and other people as Gop. Uh, the Manik who live in Thailand, a remarkably small group, uh, they uh, refer to themselves as Manik and everyone else as Hamik. Um, so these contrasts are very self-evident to people who live like this, who live in these egalitarian polities. Um, but it has lots of implications for culture, for identity, for values that extend far beyond the simple act of hunting and gathering. And Alan Barnard, who worked for a long time with the Kalahari San, um, he, he developed a, a sort of way of trying to articulate this difference. And, and I'll just briefly go through it so that you can sort of understand the sets of contrasts that uh, are so evident to these people, but less evident perhaps to us. So uh, societies like ours, we, we focus on accumulation. We see that as something that's positive and social. You should be looking after your family by making sure you have savings and, and so on. But by contrast, in these foraging societies, as he calls them, uh, accumulation is seen as antisocial. You are denying other people the enjoyment of the things that you enjoy by hoarding them for yourself. Um, and so in the hunter-gatherer societies, things are consumed immediately. Uh, you, if you have more than you can immediately consume, it is demanded from you and shared out among the community very rapidly. By contrast, that sort of immediate consumption of everything that you have is seen as sort of antisocial or, or even foolish in our own society. You should be saving for a rainy day. In our society, leadership is a positive, a public service that people uh, you know, dedicate themselves to. Whereas in these hunter-gatherer societies, leadership is seen as negative. Uh, it's, uh, people are very suspicious of people who try and uh, claim authority or status, and, and they will uh, assume that they're after something. They're trying to manipulate a situation to their advantage. And so in, in that con uh, in the context of the hunter-gatherers, what Alan calls followership uh, is positive. But he doesn't mean followership of an individual, but he rather means followership of the community, that people are very uh, concerned about the needs and interests of the community and will put those above their own uh, and will be expected to by their peers. In our own society, of course, followership, followership is seen as negative. It's you're lacking initiative. You're just a follower. You're, you're, you're a loser. You're not, not going to be someone who, who, who achieves very much in life. And we're very particular about kin classification, of course, about defining who is uh, our kin and who is not our kin. So in Alan's term, this is a non-universal kinship system. By contrast, hunter-gatherers are in principle willing to extend kinship to the whole world. 
uh, and indeed to many other species too that they share their landscape with. Um, their, their social networks are, are very often referred to, named in terms of kin relationships, uh, kin terms. And for them, in fact, society is uh, a, a society of extended kinship, of extended kin. And uh, of course, in our own uh, 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 world, uh, we, we define society in terms of nationality or tribe, depending on where, where you come from. It's something that extends beyond kin, that, that is a sort of uh, a bringing together of many non-kin groups. So that uh, really sort of uh, explains a little bit about uh, who, who or how these people organize themselves in contrast to, to people like us. But one question that I just wanted to briefly touch upon is this difference between foraging and hunting and gathering. And um, um, me and many other social anthropologists find the term foraging uh, somewhat offensive to describe these groups. And, and the reason is that uh, a non-human forager responds to objects in a rather instinctive uh, way or it, it's part of their behavioral package whereas human foragers have intention uh, they have cul culture they have imagination and so Timothy Ingold expressed it in this way where intentional socially constituted action takes over from behavioral action we can see the change from foraging to hunting and gathering you know, hedgehogs snuffling around the garden are doing something quite different to the activities of these hunter-gatherers and moving through their, their landscapes, looking for food uh, and participating together in the process. So today I'm going to outline some of those key value systems, the cosmologies and the forms of cooperation that are crucial to being an egalitarian hunter-gatherer. And, and also uh, what these actual hunter-gatherer societies teach us about uh, egalitarianism is that at heart it's about how free individuals are to make decisions concerning themselves and how society addresses individual variations. So of course each of us is unique whether that's due to our upbringing or inherited skills or both people differ in their abilities in their knowledge or skill levels in their strength and stamina their verbal skills their musical ability intelligence or physical attractiveness nature and nurture interact in the lives of every human being to make them unique how human societies address this difference is at the heart of politics as human beings experience it Despite contrasting ideologies and rhetoric justifying particular political systems, the fundamental political distinction between human societies is based on whether they assert the equality of their members or enforce status uh, inequality, uh, uh, sorry, status positions that impose inequality between their members. And of course, that's how most people understood the Cold War between communist countries and capitalist ones. But of course, the differences are more subtle and we need to look beyond the rhetoric. Communist states claimed that all are equal, but gave extensive privileges to party members. They had better cars, more income, uh, nicer houses and so on. Capitalism uses the language of equality to justify hierarchy. So the Britain, for instance, calls itself a meritocracy. Uh, the, the ideology claims that all have equal opportunity and that our different merit is rewarding, which results in different outcomes. But of course, not all are born equal. Uh, and uh, if you're a, or, or a, a have, have the ability to achieve the same to the same extent. So a white male like me living in southern Britain has many more opportunities than someone of color who lives in the north or who is female. Um, these sorts of differences in, in starting uh, undermine the ideology of meritocracy and show that actually it's an ideology which serves to entrench, further entrench uh, inequalities. While there are societies structured to ensure that all of their members are relatively equal one to another, the vast majority of contemporary societies do the opposite. They structure people into groups with unequal wealth, power, authority, and influence. They ensure the dominant sections monopolize violent force. We're familiar in the UK with the class system, in India with the caste system, and royalty, nobility, or aristocrats and commoners in many states. 
each with specialized enforcement groups, such as the police or army that ensure the status quo. Social groups lower down accept this force as protection. This is the basic social contract of the modern state. Accept the law to be protected from war. The dominance of this statist ideology has led many to imagine that all human societies depend on some form of inequality. This ideology of natural inequality is so prevalent today that most people have no idea that there are alternative ways of addressing human difference. There is no a priori reason or need for human difference to become inequality. How do egalitarian societies deal with this difference in order to ensure each is free to make their own decisions? <clears throat> that no one is coerced by others and that there's an equality of outcomes between their members rather than to tolerate authority, status, or inequality. This illuminates how economic systems and political systems are intrinsically connected, how it's possible to ensure that human differences in ability are not converted into differences in authority, status, or outcome. Only humans living as immediate return hunter-gatherers have achieved this in any systematic and thoroughgoing way. While today's hunter-gatherers are a tiny minority of the world's population, it's worth remembering that un until around 10,000 years ago, this was the dominant mode of production that all human groups uh, are survived by. And in many parts of Europe, up until around three to 5,000 years ago. And of course, many of these hunter-gatherers will have been non-egalitarian. Um, I don't have time to properly explore that with you today, but uh, that's certainly something we can talk about in the discussion if people are uh, interested. I want to focus on the specific group of hunter-gatherers that are egalitarian. So the key distinguishing feature of these hunter-gatherers societies that are assertively egalitarian is that they consume all the produce on the day that they obtain it or soon afterwards. And that's why we call them immediate return hunter-gatherers. I don't know if you can see that at the top of the screen, but it's written there. They reject leaders and claims to authority, they value their personal autonomy, and they have the most equal gender relations observed by anthropologists anywhere. These societies reject the concept of private property. They don't have major assets like fish traps um, or, or major objects such as tools that require long-term investment in order to produce them. Um, and they act actively avoid accumulating property by sharing all they have. Unfortunately for them in today's world, their impoverished appearance marks them as inferior in the eyes of their accumulative status-seeking neighbours, and this legitimates widespread discrimination against them and also the appropriation of their resources and land. Despite their military and political weaknesses of such societies, they're much more widespread than many realise. They still exist today in Australia, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Thailand, Borneo, India, and in the majority of sub-Saharan African states. Government policy is always one of sedentarization and assimilation to mainstream farming or herding communities. Despite this, hunter-gatherers continue to hunt and gather wherever it's possible. Within the last 10 years of intensifying industrial farming and conservation initiatives, uh, many are being forced uh, off their lands and they've an increasingly difficult time finding food and maintaining their culture and sophisticated knowledge. Uh, things like tracking uh, are tragically being lost as people are being prevented from hunting, being uh, defined as poachers rather than understood as hunter-gatherers. But what's particularly interesting about these immediate return hunter-gatherers for anthropologists is that they reveal many aspects of how human social organization works because they're such material and political minimalists. They have minimum property. They put great emphasis on personal autonomy and little elaboration of kinship or economy. And this makes greater equality of wealth or power and uh, of prestige has been achieved in certain hunting and gathering societies than in any other human societies. These societies, which have economies based on immediate rather than delayed return, are assertively egalitarian. It might seem odd to start uh, with a focus on the time lag between production and consumption, but actually it's in that space between 
the work required to generate food and the consumption of that food where games of power between people start to emerge. So if you just think of a farmer, the work of clearing the fields, of then planting the, the crops, of then weeding the crops, and then uh, protecting those crops from raiders, human and others, uh, before you can actually harvest the crops, uh, process them and prepare them uh, for sharing and eating. So in that long space of time, you need to organize labor, you need to ensure that labor comes at the right times, and you need to make sure that those people who put in their labor receive some benefit from the labor, labor eventually when you have the harvest. Um, and at each of those stages, there are all sorts of opportunities for people to start to assert authority, to manipulate or deprive others of their what they see as their dues if they don't uh, obey or follow the uh, instructions given to them uh, through the control of access to that product uh, at the end of the, the cycle of production. So the understanding the the longer you provide you create space between uh, m uh, the efforts required to produce food and consuming it is the space where authority by definition has to insert itself if it wishes to be uh, uh, continued over time to, to, to not just be a temporary manipulation, but something that is permanent that results in status and authority. So in these egalitarian societies, uh, egalitarianism is, is achieved through direct individual access to resources. So nobody can stop anybody from accessing a resource that they require. Um, but also the means of coercion are widely available in camp because deadly weapons for hunting are are in everybody's hut. And uh, although you know people would have uh, very strong taboos against using uh, hunting weapons against people, uh, the the fact that they're there does mean that even if you're a very weak person, uh, a stronger person will be reluctant to over pressure you. Um, because they know that if they are vulnerable while, say, sleeping, uh, you can always cause them quite serious problems with poisoned arrows or, or whatever else it might be. So there's a, a way that the, the presence of those um, dangerous weapons uh, acts as a, a, a restraint on people's excesses. But if someone does start to harass you and make you feel uncomfortable or assert authority or claim uh, authority over you, you can simply move and mobility is crucial to these societies. And because you don't have a field to protect or a, a fishing boat that you, you require, um, that mobility is very easy to enact. Within an hour, you can pack up your basket and, and be off. And uh, in these societies, there's no word for goodbye. Uh, there's no word for thank you. Uh, the idea that you uh, need to recognize your dependencies on others is something that's diminished and, and uh, uh, made minimal through the lack of those words, for instance, but through other practices too. So there are procedures that impose sharing and prevent saving and accumulation. And this is of course crucial because if I have things that you need, then I can start to make demands of you that you might not otherwise be uh, willing to, to perform, but because you need those things, you will, you will do what I, I ask. Um, and, uh, and, and systems which allow goods to circulate as needed, and, and there are a whole range of these different systems, and we can perhaps talk about them uh, uh, later. And then there are leveling mechanisms. Uh, crucial among these is mockery. Uh, it's, you know, these are very bawdy societies where people are very quick to be extremely rude about each other if they start to step outside of the egalitarian principle. And there's no age ageism here so you know it's quite common to see small children insulting old people or or older people um without any recrimination or or, or if if someone behaves badly then everyone teases them it's it's not something which is just left to their peers uh, it's it's a general community community action Avoidance, as I've mentioned, uh, is crucial. If you have an argument with somebody, there's no need to resolve it. You don't need to go and see a judge. You can simply avoid one another. You don't have uh, crucial assets to protect, so you can move off into other places and uh, uh, and just often, you know, in in human relations, time is a great healer, and uh, you spend some time apart, and when you return together, things are back in perspective, and the arguments are forgotten. Sometimes it's not, of course, but but very often it is. 
And there's a lack of dependence on specific others because each person from about the age of 11 or 12 is competent in the key skills they require to look after and feed themselves. And, uh, and, and being, being competent in all the skills you require to look after yourself is crucial to ensuring you're not dependent on other people. So there's no group or class that's hegemonic. There's no one who has the right or authority to judge or condemn others. Here, men and women are free to choose with whom they associate or to break associations such as ma marriage, should they feel dissatisfied. A woman can just break a marriage by simply leaving the hut that she's built for her husband. And he has no right to even ask her for a reason. I mean, of course, everybody will be familiar with the reason because these are such intimate societies. War is impossible in these societies. There's nobody who has the right or ability to command others to fight on their behalf. There's some very rare occasional exceptions where you have a charismatic individual who's able to persuade and mobilize a group of men to go and do something uh, to some other group, but that's extremely rare and it tends only to last as long as that charismatic individual is alive. And as soon as they've gone, the society returns to its, its normal uh, uh, conditions. There are no fixed assets to defend. Uh, production is shared and people are free to come and go as they please. They're assertively egalitarian because you don't wait for a share, but you demand a share. You don't tolerate other people's claims to special status, but you mercilessly tease them for trying or avoid them if they don't stop. You don't pressure, put pressure on people to produce, but you put massive pressure on them to share their production once it is, once it is produced. So egalitarianism is an effort, it's an active process, it's a value these societies are structured to promote, and this value is most often expressed in terms of proper sharing. What are these men doing? Well, they're eating together, they're sharing out some honey, but they're also sharing in the taste of honey. And, and this is important to, to recognize. Sharing is, of course, dividing or cutting, uh, a share is a piece or a portion, but sharing is also uniting, it's also coming together. To take part in an action or an experience, to, to perform together, to enjoy or suffer together with others. And these two meanings may seem diametrically opposed, one to cut and divide, the other to bring together in shared uh, participation, but they're also complementary. The first stresses, stresses the division of things between individuals, the second of joining individuals together in common action. In both cases, a plurality is involved. In the first, many keep separate in dividing the one thing into many parts. In the second, they join together in using or experiencing that same thing. The anthropologist Nurit Bird David criticizes the analytical dominance of the first definition of sharing in the literature trying to interpret hunter-gatherers' social behaviors. This economic bias diverts our attention from the sharers' relations. These women are sharing their bodies, they're sharing rhythms, they're sharing emotion, they're sharing space. So sharing here is much more about sharing in than it is about sharing out. The sharers of dances, of prayers, of secrets, of feelings, share in Dakamian communitas. Uh, the source of we intentionality and the normative order that has made language, culture and teaching possible among human groups. And Nuret Bird David argues that for hunter-gatherers, the significance of sharing rests more in this commun communality or commensality, doing and eating together, rather than it does on separating and dividing. And she calls this pluripresence that in these communities, people don't think of themselves as individual egos, but rather uh, as a group who are always together, who are always doing things together, experiencing their lives together. The focus on economic transactions is ethnocentric. Being pluripresent is about an extended sense of self that includes others as part of oneself. And this is perhaps difficult for us in these very, uh, anonymous societies that we inhabit but in such tiny scale societies of just a few dozens of people who know one another intimately throughout their lives sharing is really a, a very central to their appreciation and understanding of their everyday lives and activities 
And of course, there is sharing out. In this case, for instance, the Mika is sharing out a, a rather small antelope with a, a large number of people, but he's making sure that every single household has at least something to put into their pocket, into their pot. Um, and what's interesting is that even when it seems hardly worth sharing, hunter-gatherers share. So when children, say some small boys, shoot a bird, they meticulously, after cooking it, will share a, a little piece of meet with each of the children who are present around the fire with them. And, uh, and, and it's, it's really this uh, importance of, of sharing, which is what people are valuing. So for instance, in the opposite extreme, when there's huge amounts of stuff, for instance, in certain times in the fishing season, people will have so many fish that they can't consume them all. They have to start smoking them on tables in front of their huts. Um, but you'll see that as people come back with their collection of fish from, from, the, from the rivers, the streams, they will share out with their friends, even though their friends have also been at similar rivers and streams and, and got the same fish, but they still just make the action of sharing because it's about commensality. It's about that sense of community of being we together um, and not just I. It's the principle that matters. It's the majority, but the majority of ways that biological anthropologists have been theorizing sharing totally ignores this social and moral aspect and focuses almost entirely on the moral, on the economic aspect. So for instance, Frank Marlow uh, offers five different models for explaining sharing among hunter-gatherers. Hunter Frank worked with the Hadza in East Africa. And he tests each of these models by running experimental games with the Hadza in both small and large camps. So he proposes mutualism. You, you give food to those people who you, for, you, you hunted and gathered with. And of course, this is based on the, the way that a pride of lions will hunt. So uh, it will be one of the lions that brings down the animal, but all the other members of the pride will come and join in the feasting uh, of the animal. Um, then there's nepotism. You, you give food to kin. That's something we're very familiar with. Most of you in your households, if you have children and a partner, will, uh, will share your food willingly and without so uh, much fuss with those groups. Um, it's very common right across the world. Uh, then you've got reciprocity. Uh, food A for food B. So the hunter will share his meat with the gatherer who can share their honey or their wild yams. Uh, the classic example being the sharing between uh, husband and wife, for instance, um, or a sort of in-kind reciprocity, a delayed reciprocity. Um, you know, I take a share of your food now because at some point in the future I'll have food and I'll give you a share of that too. And that's a very popular view because it, it addresses this question of uncertainty which in, in production, which is a thing uh, you know, particularly Western people are, are particularly concerned about uncertainty of, of where you'll get your food in the future. Then you have this idea of costly signaling. So uh, you, you, you give out, for, you share food uh, for non-food benefits. And this is the classic show-off hypothesis that a big good hunter will share because he's repaid with mating opportunities. Uh, and a woman gains by mating with a good hunter because uh, she'll get good genes. And when you do, when people do sharing, of course, it attracts a large audience. So it's a, it's a very opportune moment for, for signaling. But uh, I mean, the costly signaling hypothesis does ignore the fact that women's gathered food is actually more important than the meat men uh, collect. And, and that's shared in a, in, a, in a rather more subtle and different way to the, the way men share, share meat. Um, but we can talk about that if anyone's interested. Um, tolerated scrounging is uh, another uh, idea. And so this is really for large amounts of meat as you, and, and this is taken from observations of uh, uh, Hadza scaring lions off their kill and taking the kill from the lions. And the, the, the basic logic is that, you know, as the lion's eating, it's getting more and more full. So it's hunger. Uh, is is less and therefore the energy it's willing to put into resisting those who are trying to scrounge the meat off it will diminish the fuller it gets and uh, and at a certain point it will just say well the cost of defending these additional units of meat is 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 so small that uh, i'm just going to let them take it so it pays to share and this is how frank uh, uh, summarizes what he he found 
they wanted to so in his experiments so in his experiments on each of these different types of, of sharing and many of you are probably familiar with these sorts of experiments they wanted to keep a larger share for themselves yet wanted others to give them an equal share when it comes to food one does not need to steal because it simply must be shared with anyone who sees it they had to share their food on a daily basis with many others while we in complex societies do not only when one experiences such constant demands to share can one fully appreciate how strong the desire can be to escape it so what he decides is that actually the the tolerated theft or scrounging is is what's really going on here but in counter to this i'd say that you can't understand a society as if there are no values or ideology if tolerated theft theft or scrounging was the case then why would a hunter even bother bringing the meat home you know it would just be easier to to kill your 60 kilogram pig eat the liver or kidneys and other easy to cook bits and then just leave the carcass where you where where it fell and, and walk back to camp with a full belly but of course that's not what happens people make a big effort the hunter he's spent three or four hours tracking that pig he's had a very dramatic battle killing it and then he has to put it on his back and carry it all the way home it's a huge job it's a really it really is hard work um so what it is is actually belief systems so in the Hadza case for instance they have a epimimites so they're particular cuts of the animal which have to be brought back to the men's group for the men to share and eat together among the bambangeli the hunter's meat is called the akila meat and that has to also be brought back uh, to camp for uh, sharing with the men and it's those sorts of practices and belief systems associated with that it's in the belief system if you don't do that you lose your hunting luck your hunting luck will will be ruined uh, and therefore you won't be a good hunter anymore so all hunters make sure they do this so the hunter brings back their meat for social region reasons and uh, you possibly can't see it because of the the picture uh, the people uh, in our screen but just to the right of Imika who's sharing out this meat is the hunter himself who's sitting there watching carefully how the meat is being shared out to ensure that it is done equally uh, for all and in that way preserving his hunting luck so he's brought it back for social and religious reasons uh, to ensure his luck and future abundance <clears throat> and so these taboos around Ekila in the case of the forest hunter gatherers in the Congo but is called uh, Ipimir for instance among the Hadza and it has it all there these this system of taboos is consistently found in every group of hunter gatherers but of course with slightly different names um and they these these uh, taboo systems are very effective at uh, imposing these rules because uh, you don't need to have the high energy of enforcement organizations or institutions uh, is self-imposed by the belief that people hold and another argument which is often put forward is that uh, sharing is a way of dealing with scarcity uh, Robert Kelly uh, put it uh, uh, as variability in foraging returns as a way of addressing variability in foraging returns you give me something now and I'll give you something later but actually uh, sharing is not a form of exchange because if you spend long enough in these camps you realize that it's the same few individuals who tend to obtain most of the food that is shared out and they don't do it for recognition status or prizes they do it for instance in terms of hunting often just because they love to hunt it's hunting can be a very compulsive activity if you are good at it and uh, uh, it's it's very dramatic the 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 uh, drama of the the battle to the death with the animal really is a drama uh, you know these are people who are hunting with spears with uh, poisoned arrows uh, it requires a lot of skill it's, it's a very dramatic process and then of course you have members of these societies who will never obtain food uh, my dear friend Mokaba uh, had polio as a small boy and lost the use of his legs uh, he walked around uh, on his hands as his only way of moving he would swim across the marshes when we changed camp um, but he was always fed uh, he always was shared with and what this I think really emphasizes is that 
you know, Mokaba is not considered to be a free rider. He is, of course, a free rider, but he's not considered like that because the emphasis in these societies is not on donor generosity, but on the recipient's right to a share. And Nick Peterson, who worked with the Ab Australian Aborigines, he 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 framed phrased this as demand sharing because it's not donor directed sharing that we're familiar with. So I have a packet of sweets and I say, oh, I'll share a sweet with you. I'll share a sweet with you. I'll share a sweet with you. But then I might not share with a whole bunch of other people who are present but and might be wanting sweets. In the hunter gatherer situation, what would happen is someone sees I have a bag of sweets and they say, give me sweets. And it's not my right to refuse them. It's my obligation to offer them, to make them available. So they put their hand in, they take a, a handful of sweets out and they go back to wherever they're sitting. And those people around them see that they've got these sweets they can't immediately consume. And so they say, give me sweets. And, and they take those sweets. And, uh, and other people will be coming to me and say, give me sweets and take those sweets. And so without me having any control over how the distribution is managed, the sweets will quickly infiltrate the whole group and everybody will have a sweet. And this is the difference between a donor controlled uh, uh, sharing and recipient controlled sharing. And most often, the hunter will not be the person dividing up and sharing out their meat. It will be other people that take it as soon as they return to camp. In many of these hunting and gathering societies, you have what's called the own kill rule. So that the kill the hunter made is actually taboo for them to consume. They, they cannot consume the meat that they kill. They have to share it out with others. Um, and, you know, even in the case of, say, something as dramatic and dangerous as elephant hunting, the elephant hunter, the man who actually kills the elephant, risks his life uh, to do so, will not be able to enjoy any of the meat, even though the community will take two or three weeks to, to, to eat that animal. So it does seem surprising, given the views of the hunter-gatherers themselves, that as anthropologists, so many continue to be dominated by thinking about sharing in terms of, of, of reciprocity, of its economic uh, aspects. Of course, in the opposite to immediate return systems, delayed return systems like our own society, um, then sharing really is very much donor organized and it becomes uh, something which is extremely effective at uh, consolidating and perpetuating status positions, inequality and authority. <clears throat> so in these hunter-gatherer societies, the, the group is the unit of co cooperation. And this cooperation is not like the capitalist authoritarian ones, uh, styles of cooperation we might be familiar with. And nor is it the genetically encoded preconditioned behavior like the cooperation of bees or ants. Uh, it's an acquired cultural tradition with all the implications that this has for variety. So Timothy Ingold, for instance, suggests that uh, sharing is the, the common purpose uh, of these hunter-gathering bands. It's, it's what initiates the production process. They want to share with each other. So it almost is as if sharing is the material life process of society itself. It's in fact the most common moral value that these societies will expl express explicitly. Um, and, and it's also probably the most common cause for disputes between members of such societies. It has so many uh, political ramifications. In this photograph, uh, Makongo, the man in the blue t-shirt on the left has killed this pig. He's made a significant effort to carry it back home uh, to the camp. Mbatiti, as soon as he got into camp, was an alerted that he had meat because all the children would go, whoa, and sing out uh, in a very loud way to, to tell everybody that meat has come. Mbatiti took the pig from Makongo, butchered it, and then you can see the old man in the hat, Tato, who is uh, it's saying, well, look, that piece has lots of bones, so don't give it to the old people because their teeth won't be able to handle it. Give it to that family of kids there. They've got lots of kids. They'll really enjoy that piece. All oh, right, look, that bit's got lots of fat. Give it to the, the, the hut with the widows in it. They'll enjoy that very much. And so each of the pieces of meat is being distributed and Makongo is having a careful eye on it to make sure that everybody gets a bit that they will enjoy and so uh, will maintain his hunting life. Um, we, of course, uh, associate sharing here in Britain with kin, 
and and we sort of think well we're giving it to kin so it's not really giving it away because kin are part of ourselves of course and and uh and this ideology of interconnectedness that that we use in kin uh is interpreted in different ways by different groups so by sharing with someone you are treating them like kin and so in fact they can become kin and in these hunting and gathering societies it's that performative identity which is so crucial to their valuation of sharing by sharing together we're emphasizing our connectedness our our, our being togetherness so how can we understand the rules of sharing are they just random how are they enforced and how are they made effective just because everyone is constantly asking um, in the way that uh, Frank Marlowe suggests well they are carefully organized uh, you know it depending on what how an animal is killed or who kills it uh, they will be uh, differently organized a dog for instance who kills an animal will get the lungs uh, a hunter who spears a pig will get the heart the men's group will get the liver the kidney and the chest um, men and women have different ways of sharing when women collect food in the forest they immediately eat as much as they like with the children that they've got with them but then they continue if there's more food to collect they'll continue collecting it and whatever excess production they have they share with all who are present with them and everyone brings their little bundle back to camp and then they'll share out with anybody in the camp who hasn't got any of those say wild yams that they've collected and then they'll prepare the food and once the food's prepared they will make little leaf plates that they then pass around to their girlfriends and give one to the men in who sit in the middle of camp and so the uh the meat is shared uh, sorry the the food is shared in 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 many instances it's it's shared much more than would be logically necessary just to to, to ensure that the food is shared uh it, it's a process of showing your affection of of realizing that affection through your actions but uh, the way the Benjeli, the Bayakas, talk about sharing is in terms of these rules I've called ekila, or they call ekila that I've mentioned already, these taboos that, that in fact are quite unusual and, and, and striking, things that you would really like to eat, you're suddenly forbidden from eating uh, because of the life stage you are at. And this, this really provokes curiosity in the minds of those who witness them. Um, and so, in fact, what happens with these rules is that nobody ever tells you them explicitly. They're just mentioned at particular moments when they're being broken very often, when they're not being respected. Uh, so a, a small boy will hear hunters talking about their aquila as he accompanies them uh, out hunting and slowly will start to piece together some of the the ideas as, as associated with it so in effect these taboo structures what they're doing is provoking each generation to figure out through their own natural curiosity uh why these weird prohibitions are being imposed on people uh it's it's a, a way of making connections between different aspects of cosmology uh, folk biology uh theories of of abundance uh, that are held by their community um, but 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 achieving that knowledge not through instruction but through your own uh, curiosity driven explorations and it's those explorations that then make you feel that knowledge as your own as a personal knowledge as something which is uh, your own achievement and, and therefore not something that uh, you're following but something that you understand so just to give you a sense of of some of these uh, uh, strange beliefs uh, a menstruating woman is said to be a killer. Uh, a hunter's luck is a killer. It's a killer for a pregnant woman to eat blue dikers, a small antelope, forest antelope, that's very easy to catch and, and very popular and delicious. Um, and if she eats these dikers, she'll have difficult childbirth. Uh, it's a killer to burn ticks on a fire. Of course, ticks have have swallowed blood and so if you removed one from yourself you mustn't burn it on a fire it will make people who eat food from that fire go mad uh, if you laugh at dead animals you ruin the ikila of the hunter so they have no luck uh, if my wife sleeps around my ikila my hunting will be ruined if i sleep around her ikila is ruined and she has difficult she'll have a difficult childbirth or our very young children may become ill and so as you start to witness people talking about these things, as it did indeed to me as an anthropologist, your curiosity is, is piqued. You, you start to wonder why on earth should those things be connected? 
And it's in fact that uh, counterintuitive logic, which is crucial to these systems of taboo, to provoke people to, to explore other areas, to, to seek the connections that make those practices have meaning and, and have logic. And as you realize some of the uh, linkages, they change and transform how you understood previous link linkages. And, uh, and this returns to the something that's often forgotten by social anthropologists is that, uh, of course, uh, cultural understandings have an ontogeny. Uh, they, they, they develop in different ways at different points during our lives. And so this young man, Simba, uh, he has the beginning of a developing theory of proper sharing of Ikila, um, whereas Fata, the old man, still has a developing theory of proper sharing, but a much more sophisticated and, uh, uh, and developed one than uh, Esimba does. Culture does come in bits and pieces, uh, and they come through our consciousness and transform in the process and return years later to be reconsidered and understood in different ways. If you take the uh, idea of father, as a very small boy, when I was two or three years old, my idea of the, what the word father meant had a particular significance to me of this large protective figure, perhaps. But as I passed through life, uh, my understanding as I became a teenager of what father was as this repressive controller who was stopping me from doing all the things I wanted to do um, changed. But then as in later life, I became a father myself, my understanding of father changed again. And then as my own children started to have their children and I became grandfather, my understanding of father extended again into, into more, or unfolded into more dimensions. And, uh, and this is why it's very important to take into account how we learn culture, um, rather than just to assume that these uh, concepts are fixed and ready-made and, and don't uh, change as we, we move through life. And when we understand that process of how we actually learn culture in reality, um, it becomes much easier to, to understand why these taboo systems are so effective to, uh, to, to, to communicate across generations very specific knowledge about why uh, those, those societies do the things they do in the way they, they do them. So what Ekila does is it anchors key cultural knowledge and transmits uh, these values and, and practices across generations without recourse to authority figures. And it does that because the, the inculcation of these understandings remains largely nonverbal. It's contained in bodily comportment. And, and that's very difficult to intentionally manipulate for personal advantage. And it's only possible to infer from an ideological infrastructure that is acquired piecemeal over many years. And this is, in, and this is what informs a range of very seemingly unrelated actions and their consequences. Um, and that's because, of course, a politically egalitarian society means no leadership roles, no authority figures to tell others what to do, uh, where even parents can't order children. Uh, among the Bayaka, as soon as a child can walk, they can decide where they sleep. Um, and so if parents are mean or, or arguing the whole time, then children will just move away. And, and, and it puts a pressure on parents to actually think harder and, and care for their children. And some of you may be familiar that these Bayaka fathers are considered to be the best fathers in the world because they spend much more time caring and looking after small infants and children than do fathers anywhere else in the world. Um, <clears throat> But what's very striking is that uh, there's a whole group of these very similarly organized taboos across the world among these egalitarian hunter-gatherers that really focus at the most elemental level on maintaining a distinction between the blood of fertility, of human fertility, as most uh, powerfully symbolized by menstruation and menstrual blood, and the blood of killing animals, which is male blood. And it is actually at the the, the, the core basis of the human sexual division of labor is, uh, is based on the maintenance of this distinction between these two very powerful forms of blood, both of which are, are absolutely crucial for the continuation and perpetuation of human society. Um, sorry, I'm just to uh, uh, see that uh, time is passing and I just want to... to make sure I, um, so 
the Mbengele really do understand the forest as a living being. It's not an object that's made of many trees and branches, it's a, but it's a sentient and sapient multi-organism of which they are a part. And this is a, a very common feature of many indigenous peoples, is understanding themselves not as separate from their environment, but as emergent in their environment. And, uh, and indeed, I think it's a very important thing we, we have lost in our individualized Western uh, lifestyle. And uh, Aquila as a process by which everyone is educated in what constitutes proper sharing is in fact what assures that for the entirety of their cultural memory, uh, they've experienced this forest as a place of abundance. They have uh, no word for, hung uh, for starvation. And when I told people that there are places in the world where people are starving to death, they didn't believe me. They just thought it's, it's, it's rather like me telling you that there's a place in your hometown where uh, you will suffocate from lack of oxygen. You know, if you're walking around on the streets outside, you'll somehow uh, arrive somewhere where you will no longer be able to breathe. It's just so preposterous to these hunter gatherers. It, it's, it's beyond belief. So people in these societies should be successful in their activities because they understand the environment as abundant, as having everything that people need. And if they're not successful, it's not because they or somebody else has not, uh, um, has, sorry, if they are not, it is because they or somebody else has not followed Aquila rules or has ruined their Aquila. Someone has not been sharing properly. As a collection of strikingly counterintuitive rules with dire consequences, Aquila promotes a distinctive disembodied pedagogic process that stimulates curiosity and desire to find out why this weird stuff has to be done, which prompts and ensures each generation of Mbengeli or Bayaka discover their culture for themselves. They can reconstruct it for themselves without recourse to authority figures, and this makes learning cultural practices more like a personal journey of revelation than instruction or dogma. Aquila makes sense within its own logic of smells and of proper sharing. I haven't had time to explain all that properly to you, but, but there is, I can provide you with papers and material I've written about that. And because it's largely unexpressed as a body of practices, a unitary body of practices, it's very difficult to be managed. Aquila is very difficult to manage by authority. It condenses meanings and values to establish a cultural store, ensuring internal communications between the generations without attributing special status to or authority to individuals or institutions. It works by hidden persuasion, ontogenetically anchored in inevitable and striking life processes like menstruation and hunting. So Mbengeli rituals are centrally concerned with maintaining and celebrating abundance of resources for people by establishing a dialogue between people and the rest of the forest. And I'll be talking a lot more about that and, and how it acts to uh, as a pedagogic process. Music is pedagogy in these societies. And people understand themselves as part of the forest. So when you sing and dance to the forest, it's like you're talking to a friend, you're, you're sharing with, with someone close to you. And if you share with someone close to you, then you can also demand shares from them. And that's why from their point of view, their ritual practices are effective. They are able to get things from the forest. And, and they have a proverb, a, 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 a pygmy loves the forest as he loves his own body. Um, abundance is taken as the natural st state. People have an unswerving faith that the forest will always provide them with what they need. It's why they don't bother accumulating or storing because they have this trust in the abundance of nature. So this is quite a contrast with our own obsession to solve, say, environment, uh, environmental issues by improving management strategies or improving technical processes for food production, rather than really focusing on inequality. I think the Bayaka and these hunter-gatherers are really saying it much straighter than, than we manage to. What they say is that by sharing properly with all present and treating resources respectfully, they will always be experienced as abundant. And indeed, for them in their cultural history, so they have been.
And I think I'll stop there. That was uh, amazing. Let's go to gallery view. Uh, Jeremy, that was uh, so amazing. Um, uh, <clears throat> my rule is that I'm never the first person to ask a question. I try to be the fourth person to ask a question. And so uh, please uh, raise your virtual hands to queue up. And uh, I'm just buzzing with questions, but um, uh, so thank you and first and foremost, uh, uh, so much there. So uh, who wants to ask the first question? Aha, Chris. Thank you, David. Yeah, I, I'm thinking about, um, you know, where in our own cultures we see people with <laughs> immediate Im immediacy <laughs> in terms of their resources. And uh, just a conversation I had recently uh, talking about people uh, living in squats uh, in Paris, for example, uh, where my son lives. Uh, and and um, his sense was that they were able to live in a very uh, non-hierarchical, uh, cooperative way. And I'm just wondering if you know, if you, there's, you know, you know of any thought about about that, about what happens uh, in, in contemporary society when, when people live kind of hand to mouth like that. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> that's a very pertinent point. And, and it is actually exactly as you say, those people who are living very hand to mouth who are able to maintain much more egalitarian relations than, than other people. Um, another example are uh, the, the sort of street people, people who, homeless people living on the streets. And, and their communities tend to be rather aggressively egalitarian. Um, and they are very insistent on demand sharing whatever one of their members has uh, that they can't immediately consume. And I do think that this reflects to some extent the deep ingrained nature of this mode of life for human beings right across the world. Um, I mean, it, we, if we get into the evolutionary discussions, and, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with them, I put the paper by uh, Whiten and Erdl uh, as, as a potential reading for anyone who, the sociocognitive, the human sociocognitive niche. Um, but in my own work, I mean, I think it's really crucial to appreciate the extent to which egalitarianism, the, the overthrow of the harem, uh, of the alpha male dominated fear-based society of our primate relatives, is actually crucial to explaining the extraordinary encephalization, the, the expansion in brain size uh, among human, well, homo. And without understanding, uh, you know, how that could happen, I don't think we can really explain uh, the, 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 how human evolution got to the point where we could have these eight, 1800 cc brains. I mean, the, there's the gray ceiling that you may be familiar with, the 600 cc. And all species apart from us who have exceeded the grace, all primate species who've exceeded the grace ceiling um, have gone extinct. Um, it's just not been possible for them to sustain that level of, of demand, uh, or the, particularly mothers, uh, of course, uh, on, on the, uh, uh, for nurturing their infants um, without some sort of solution to that uh, very competitive Machiavellian primate social order that is much more common uh, in our closest relatives and and I think that we have that deeply ingrained this egalitarianism is deeply ingrained in us because it precisely is what allowed us to free ourselves from those constraints and develop a normative order with language uh, with uh, culture pedagogy all those things that we consider to be so central to being human thank you Richard has his hand up. So you're on mute. I was muted. I was muted. <laughs> Richard and then Jordan. Uh, thank you so much, Jerome. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, Thanks, Richard. This, this isn't a question. It's more of a reflection on my local context. Um, in a small village near Reading in the UK. And I was particularly 
captured by ideas of abundance and trying to do something different in my village. We have uh, allotments where people traditionally grow their own food for themselves, take it home. As a group, we've tried to do something di different where we grow as a group and then we share all of that produce with people in the village. And we've been putting it in the local cafe for people to help themselves to, and no one's been taking it. It's oh, just see. been left there on the shelf. So it's just fascinating for me just to kind of think about all the rules that are going on in terms of our behavior um, in a non-egalitarian context, really, in culture. Um, and there's, yeah, there's, there's free food and people aren't helping themselves to it because of all the rules. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to yeah, shift things, yeah, ch change the culture a bit. Well, it's very interesting you give that example. And one of the things I've noticed in the uh, uh, in our own society is the the way that free food, I mean, I often see it, I, I'm a very active forager, and there are a number of fruit trees in our local park, for instance. And you just, if, if I don't collect them, and I can't actually collect as much as, as is provided, uh, they just rot, people leave them, they abandon them. And I do think that we've become so uh, used to packaging food <clears throat> That there's a certain distrust to food that hasn't come in a package or doesn't you know get pulled off a supermarket shelf where you're confident that health and safety have uh, been uh, you know mobilized to to, uh, to 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 judge the quality of that food and so on and perhaps that's partly what's happening in your context is that because the food is free people think there must be something wrong with it they they somehow don't trust that uh, that it that it's perfectly good food um, I mean, maybe maybe I'm jumping to conclusions, but but I would suspect that there is something about that in our own society, and certainly from just where I live in South London, uh, the number of fruit trees and 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 other fruiting uh, bushes and so on that are just left to rot is is really shocking. Um, so I think that yeah, we, we we I mean it's a very nice initiative. Um, it's funny how the free food that people give out in supermarkets for food banks tends to be tinned food it tends to be packaged food it's it's very rarely fresh food and uh, and perhaps uh, you know if if you can find out where the nearest food banks are you might find a much more appreciative audience to that social effort of yours anyway thanks david that's uh, very nice uh, richard sorry that's a very nice comment jordan thank you jerome um i have i'm going to sneak in two questions and you can answer whichever one is more interesting to you or or both, but um, the first one is when when I talk to friends of mine that are good dialogue partners, and I I share some of the things that are exciting to me about learning about indigenous cultures. And I'm not close to an expert, but I just read stuff and think, wow, you know, wouldn't it be great if we're more like them? Sometimes I get this pushback of like that I'm being a little bit I'm I'm engaging in kind of a noble savage kind of thinking or idealizing. Um, a different way of life and not acknowledging big problems or, or things like that. And so I'm curious, that's my first question, if there's any validity to that or how you respond if people ever bring that up. The second thing has to do, I think, with some of the other comments. And um, I'm, I think oftentimes about the idea of ownership and private property and things like that as a kind of um, an assumption of our civilization that is very related to all of these these differences and changes and how we don't uh, seem to to have carry on this sharing ethic as we used to and i'm wondering i'm sure there's people that have written about this but i'm wondering about that if that is seen by you and others as as a big moment in human evolution that we've adopted this kind of assumption that you can own property you can have private property um and that's those are my two questions okay two great questions thank you jordan um so the noble savage um well there's firstly the self-evident answer which of course there are people who romanticize and uh will imagine all sorts of wonderful things going on among indigenous peoples and 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 not and ignore some of the more problematic and difficult elements and yes of course that does happen but <laughs> and this is an important but uh, there are also extraordinary experiments in how 
the human condition can be expressed, can be shared, can be uh, lived among these groups, which are extremely important for us to pay attention to. The arrogance of uh, progress is that somehow our societies, our civilization is on this constant move to improvement, to more efficiency, to better efficacy. And of course, we know from the very serious uh, menace that our civilization has caused to the very basis of our lives, to the biosphere that we depend upon, um, that this is not the case, that clearly our civilization, our approach to the to how we feed and, and value ourselves and value other things in, in this uh, complex biosphere is is lacking and uh, is 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 being uh, very challenged as far as I can see. So while uh, you know there are people who romanticize indigenous people, there is also a huge amount we can learn from indigenous people if we are a little bit more modest and humble. Uh, in understanding our own failures and weaknesses and uh, and I think that you know things like sharing um uh sort of some of the new forms of animism that are that are evolving are uh, which are based on indigenous points of uh, indigenous practices and points of view are actually very helpful and and actually desperately needed if we are to find the sort of shift in uh awareness consciousness behavior that's required for our civilization as a whole to start to become an ecological civilization as opposed to a capitalist civilization. Um, and, and that will only come by listening carefully to the wisdom that is held in some of these indigenous traditions. And indeed, uh, David mentioned in the introduction, I have an organization called Flourishing Diversity. And that's precisely what we're trying to do is to promote a much greater awareness of these alternatives. And the fact that there are these human groups who've proven through practice that they work. It's not just uh, you know philosophizing. This is real people in real places making those systems function effectively for them and over very long periods of time. And we do well, I think, to pay much more attention to that and and uh, in humility, of course, and and with you know a bit of sort of hard nosed skepticism where people are making grand claims. But but nonetheless, I think it's a really important resource for us in this current period, and and vital for us to attend to. Yeah, so I had a big section. Sorry. Oh, oh no, go ahead. Keep going. So I just I had a big section in the talk where I was going to talk about private property, um, but uh, but I left it out. And of course, this uh, this is something which is, it, you know is an ideology. And and you've got Jean Jacques Rousseau in his famous uh, uh, discourse on inequality. You know, the first man who uh, thought of uh, putting a fence around a piece of land and persuaded others to believe that this was his property <laughs> was the real founder of civil society. And of course, you know, there's a great truth in that. Um, but, you know, private property is roundly rejected by these groups. And it they're, they're sort of position is you know that the creator made the whole world for all creatures to share and that you as a human being have no greater claim to any part of it than does an antelope or a fly or a an ant you know th this world is for all creatures to share and and it was designed that way and we should <laughs> we should try and uh, support that and and uh, and help it to be and when you have notions of private property you immediately have notions of accumulation. Uh, uh, private property leads very quickly to status, to conceptions of depriving others and, and withholding what that property in, uh, is concerned with from other people. And as soon as you start doing that, you get power, you get control. Um, and, 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 and that is uh, at the heart of, of, of so many of our problems. And the inequality that we're currently experiencing is at such a high level that if you look at past civilizations and uh, Jared Diamond's famous book on collapse, uh, you can see that essentially uh, we are in a period of collapse. When civilizations get this degree of inequality, it leads to collapse. It's very simple. Um, but uh, but nobody's really listening uh, hard enough at, at the level of government. Um, and we anyway, in this country, in Britain, we have some crazy ideas about how to proceed, which seem to reinforce so many of these inequalities and, and, and grotesque uh, 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 sufferings by those who do not have. So, yes, I mean, we can talk about private property a lot, but uh, I'm a bit conscious of time here. But yeah, thanks, Jordan. Those are great questions. Yeah, so. Um, <laughs> um, 
we scarcely know where to um, uh, to begin. So, I mean, one of the amazing things is that the, the sharing society is is uh, in some ways um, so different from ours. You said there's no word for thank you. Yeah. <laughs> like, wow, I'll, this is a sharing society with no word for thank you, and it's it's a matter of taking basically. That you know, if you have something, I don't say please, can I have it, and thank you for giving. I say that that's give mine. Me. Give it, give it yeah, to me. Give it to me. Yeah. Uh, so isn't that amazing? Well, I wanted yeah. to compare the, what you sh shared with us with this book, Sand Talk, um, mm -hmm. How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World by the uh, Tyson Yunka uh, Porta, who is yeah. a hybrid. And I think um, cultural hybrids are so interesting. And, and uh, so uh, Tyson does not want to present himself as like pure indigenous thought. He has a foot in both cultures. And that, in fact, makes him a useful interpreter. But um, he talks about the folk figure of Emu. Let me quote it quickly because it, I think it poses an interesting similarity and contrast with, with what you have described. So he says, Emu is a troublemaker who brings into being the most destructive idea in existence. I am greater than you. You are less than me. This is the source of all human misery. Aboriginal society was designed over thousands of years to deal with this problem. Some people are just idiots. And everybody has a bit of idiot in them from time to time, coming from some deep place inside that whispers, you are special. You are greater than other people and things. You are more important than everything and everyone. All things and all people exist to serve you. This behavior needs massive checks and balances to contain the damage it can do. There's a lot of stories that explain how all this began. Um, and my favorite, is a dreaming story of the meeting in which all species sat down for a yarn to decide which one would be the custodial <laughs> species for all of creation. Emu made a hell of a mess, running around, showing off his speed and claiming his superiority, demanding to be boss and shouting over everyone. You can see the dark shape of Emu in the Milky Way. Kangaroo, his head, of, his head the Southern Cross, is holding him down. Echidna is grasping him from behind and the great serpent is coiled around his legs containing the excesses of malignant narcissists is a team effort. So now on one hand, this, is, this account is agreeing with you about it, the egalitarian society, but on the other hand, it seems to be representing uh, selfishness, what we would call selfishness and what he does, as something which is you know ever present and needing to be controlled. And what you described seemed to be a, a, a system in which that is not the case, and uh, in which uh, uh, basically the way that people think about themselves and others just it, it's almost like not part of the parameter space. This kind of self-aggrandizing behavior, and so I'm really interested in your thoughts on on on, on both the similarity and the difference with uh, if if it is if I if I'm interpreting it correctly with uh, with Tyson's account. Okay, well, that's a very good point and uh, and, and, and an excellent uh, question. So selfishness, of course, uh, like all human qualities, can be culturally encouraged or discouraged. And, uh, and the key thing about these societies is that they are extremely adept at cultivating, uh, well, sorry, at not cultivating selfishness is perhaps the way to say it. So, for instance, one of the first games that parents will play with very, very small infants is to give them something and then to take it from them, to give them something and then to take it from them. One of the first words that children learn after mother and, and, and father will be, Kabame, give me, give me, give me. Uh, and and there's so many games which is kabame and then kabame and kabame kabame and it's just giving taking giving taking giving taking all the time and uh and it, it really it, you know i mean that's just one way but then as well the celebration of sharing this the celebration of commensality the way people talk about each other not as individuals but as how that person was behaving with other people not how i speak but how uh, we spoke together as a group. Um, so th th the frame of reference uh, that the culture encourages is one which isn't based on the individual seeking whatever their joy is, but on how the group can uh, can achieve joy. So children's games never focus on women, winners or losers. They focus on increasing collaboration to improve the joy and pleasure people get. So a very a nice example of when you have young saplings, 
the kids all climb up to the top of the tree. And of course, as the, they climb up, the tree bends over and then they agree among themselves who, who's going to stay on. And, uh, and then they all let go at the same time. And the kid who's hanging on gets an amazing ride uh, on the tree. And then they all climb up again and the, the tree bends over and then they decide someone else. But, but that, that's the, the classic way that these societies cultivate uh, or, or, or avoid cultivating some of those more toxic uh, behaviours. Um, I'll just briefly give you the example of the Batek, who are rather extraordinary as being some of the most peaceful people on earth. So their violent behaviour is teased and mocked as if it's madness. And people who behave violently are... Are, are said to be, you know, mad and 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 displaying psychotic behaviours, and the result is is that that violence as an appropriate response to uh, behaviours is just not considered. It, it it really is not somewhere some way uh, a way to behave. And I had a very strong example of this when I went to visit one of my PhD students working with the Batek. And one of the Batek men had been working on a palm oil plantation for a few weeks. And when he returned to the camp, he was he discovered that his wife had been sleeping with somebody else. And if we had been among the Bayaka, uh, there would have been a big noise and he would have made a great fuss. And, and sh you know, if the man was there, probably have resulted in a fight of some sort or at least a fight with his wife. Um, but here, the man instead, he sat down outside the hut and he just quietly wept. And and everybody, you could just see the pain they felt for this poor man and in, in the pain he felt of, uh, due to his wife's behavior. And after about two hours of him sitting there, just looking so miserable and ignoring, not answering anybody, he just got up and left to another camp. And then the people commenting to this woman about how terrible it was that she <laughs> Anyway, it was so effective. You know, he really had made his point, but without any... Uh, aggression or violence anyway so these things can be socialized in or out of people and different societies take different views on these qualities and and that's really my my response to that wow that's incredible uh kathleen well i'll, I'll try and make this quick because we're running out of time uh like you like david uh jerome i just don't know where to start this conversation has been there this presentation has been so rich but as a former clinician, I'll say there is a distinction between um, healthy entitlement, which is, a, you know, an aspect of a healthy personality and selfishness or malignant narcissism. And it's I was just thinking about, well, how does all this apply to Ostrom's principles? You know, there it's a, there is a way that transparency, accountability and conflict re resolution are regulated in a way that is that does work. That is part of that systemic fabric that results in maintaining that shared identity, that strong so cohesive shared identity. And it will be difficult to sort of map those ideas onto contemporary society with people that are used to having their private TV and, you know, things like that. But I wanted to just add quickly a little sidebar. As somebody that spent a lot of time years ago with a radical economist, somebody into Henry George's work, uh, who was promoting an activist for land value taxation, um, I, he, my, uh, my friend used to say that in English, the word owner is derived from a far owner, older meaning. It was those that began to enclose the common that took away from the commonwealth, owed others. And ownership originally meant, the, it referred to owing the collective, not having the right to extract from the collective. So mm -hmm. I do want to say that there might have been something pre-existing, even in our cultures, our, uh, our older uh, northern cultures, um, uh, that is just reflected in our current language. But it's interesting how things get twisted. And that's the other aspect of caging power, consolidating power, is symbolic meaning systems get distorted through duplicity and, and manipulation to serve the purposes of a few against the interests of the whole. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good point. And I think in the northern hemispheres, uh, we have a particular challenge as human societies, which is that um, we have this hunger season where nothing grows, where there isn't stuff to collect. 
and uh, and clearly, uh, you know, if you look at the hunter gatherers who live in the regions where you have an extreme hunger season, they are all obliged to get involved in some kind of hoarding and storing. Um, and of course, the northwest coast uh, over in the states is uh, you've got numerous societies, very good examples of this. Some hunter gatherers with nobles, commoners, and slaves, uh, you know, where you depend on these salmon rivers for your your survival during the winter. So um, there are material constraints to the possibilities of human life, and uh, in different places uh, they pose different sorts of challenges. And clearly, one uh, element of that has been the emergence of very strong notions of ownership uh, by those people who who who, who live in these uh, seasonal, very seasonal environments. Um, but uh, yes, and the commons and the enclosure of the commons, I mean, we're already very well is established in these delayed return systems uh, by the time that happens. And it's clearly a sort of coup. Uh, I, I, I always think of it as, you know, the, the and sorry, this is a very personal view, but that European aristocrats are effectively the mafia of the medieval period who successfully <laughs> applied. And, and the, the social contract of the state, you know, accept my law and I'll protect you from law. Of uh, war, sorry, is is basically the mafia's contract. You know, it, it works in Napoli as well as it does in in the state yeah. of Britain or anywhere else. So, yeah, there are some deep roots to this in in our European. Uh, well, uh, so um, I'm going to go. If people have to leave, uh, please. Thank you so much. And I, I would like to ask a final question before um, before we sign off. And uh, 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 Jerome, it's so great. Not only will you be coming back two weeks from now, but and we are working on. Uh, an ongoing collaborative potential between our organizations. And I think that what you bring to a social world, it just, I mean, we talk all the time of needing to go beyond weird, Western educated, industrial rich democratic. We're trying to do that. We're succeeding to a degree, but to really succeed to this degree, to understand cultural diversity uh, to this extent, and not just academically, but in terms of actual engagement, because I know that you are an activist and, and you serve as an advocate for these societies, in addition to uh, um, to uh, someone who uh, uh, studies them, is just incredible. And, and and one reason that uh, so this is this is introducing you to to our community in a way that we hope that you'll be a permanent member. Uh, but I wanted to bring up. Uh, a book that I'm sure you know well, The Ritual Process by Victor Turner. Mm. Uh, and the thesis of that is, is that even societies that have become highly differentiated and certainly have uh, leadership, sometimes even hereditary kings and ownership, um, actually, um, so their structure, as he put it, uh, but there's also remains a spirit of communitas, which is the spirit of a leaderless society. and. Uh, Turner says it is ritual that, that binds them to each other. And so even you can get a society that has gone far beyond um, um, a, a literalist a society, but it's not like the mafia. And that's because there is some kind of bottom-up control so that if there is that kind of misbehavior among the powerful, uh, there is the means to bring them under control. And of course, some structure is needed once societies become large, then just for it to function as a society needs more structure. So I thought, I just wondered if you, uh, if that remains valid. I mean, if uh, the thesis of that book remains at least somewhat valid. Yeah, I mean, the, so Victor Turner's idea is that in these moments of ritual, you can experience the the opposite of your normal social relations and so if you're a very hierarchic society you suddenly ex experience this in the liminal stages of the ritual the possibility of uh, of being equal of of uh, a shared sense of uh, belonging to uh, the group and um and this is of course very important um there it can be manipulated to reinforce inequalities as easily as it can be to uh, uh, help people understand the, the, the alternatives and the possibilities. And I'm not sure to what extent he would argue their checks and balances uh, are, uh, are provided through the ritual process, but certainly to some extent, it's a very important way that uh, uh, 
in egalitarian societies, inequality can emerge. So Australian Aborigines, for instance, have a very uh, hierarchically organized ritual system where young men are only eligible to be initiated uh, to certain levels when old men agree. And they can only marry once they have achieved a certain level of initiation. And the result is, is that old men are able to manipulate the labor of young men uh, in the process of those young men wanting wives. Uh, and and results in, despite them having a very egalitarian economic order, having a very inegalitarian political order. The reason I give that example, David, is just because it works in both ways. So you can have very inegalitarian societies that use those mo liminal moments of egalitarian experience in ritual as a way, in fact, of, of, of reinforcing the structures of inequality that exist outside of ritual. Yeah. Uh, likewise, egalitarian societies that use ritual to produce these moments of liminality, which are very inegalitarian, which serve as, uh, as well to uh, have consequences beyond the ritual. So it, it's one of those forces which is you need to think about carefully, um, but it is absolutely correct, uh, Turner's idea of the ritual process, that these liminal stages of, of the ritual are these reversals of the, the social order, which are very important for maintaining and managing that social order in a way that, that, that the community uh, supports. Yeah, and I think that this is one of the things we intend to explore together, is that the, the, the um, inequalities that we associate with... Uh, modern life and especially the ones that are by the dominant societies imposing upon other other societies these are due to forces of multi-level cultural evolution and mm. those forces are present in every society on earth every society on earth is experiencing this tension basically between levels of of um, uh, selection uh, and 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 the balance falls in some ways into an extreme egalitarianism sometimes into extreme despotism and um, and so I think that saves yeah. that saves us from being this over, overly romanticized view, um, and yeah. uh, and I think that uh, to explore that and to to um, establish that is an important thing that we'll be doing. Well, everyone, so great. And then for anyone who can join us at six, it'll just be we could discuss this for those who were present, and um, and then uh, we'll see you all uh, on high low at any time and. Uh, and um, uh, online next Friday for Timothy Waring, which will be another great uh, talk on cooperative, modern day cooperatives, the history of modern day uh, cooperatives. And so all good, thank you. Thank you very much, David, and look forward to getting to know you all much better.